Okay, so coming back to this, we deal with the um, the material explanation, which uh, belongs to that side of the commentary, which basically focuses on the things that the Europeans did have and the things that the native populations did not have. Um, mentioning that diseases <laughs> stands out as being one of the biggest ones. But what about the other side of the interpretation? Um, the idea that the uh, native populations um, had a more uh, harmonious or egalitarian understanding of themselves, if not the natural world, something that the invaders um, exploited or took advantage of. Well, we should uh, look for the truths and the facts that exist within this interpretation as well. Now, here, of course, we run the risk of uh, speaking about an enormous number of people and different groups of people um, in this uh, unified way. But if we had to say generally, collectively speaking, um, it does seem that the native populations had a more sophisticated understanding of the relationship between uh, humans and nature. Now you see some of the famous uh, totem poles from the uh, Pacific North uh, West. And a couple examples of these include removing distinctions between um, the natural Natural and the supernatural, which seems to have been a uh, belief practice that was entrenched in many groups of individuals, not seeing uh, the supernatural or the divine as being divorced from the natural world, but rather seeing divinity or supernatural events as kind of vibrating among all facets of the environment. So divinity present in uh, people, and animals and plants as well, and all part of this harmonious, um, interconnected uh, whole. And also accepting that amid the fluctuations of the natural world, any human conquest could be only uh, temporary. This also seems to have been a common uh, religious and cultural belief. The idea that uh, the natural world is not there to be uh, conquered and overrun by people or to be ruled by people because people can't do that. We're not capable of actually dominating the natural world. And the general perception um, seems to have been oriented towards the idea that we have a lot more in common with animals than um, we would readily acknowledge. That in fact, the similarities between humans and animals are much greater than the dissimilarities. That there's this kind of um, interconnected link between us, which is a perspective that I think was uh, lost in the Western world for a, one, a long time, but has been revived in recent years, been revived uh, scientifically, been revived through studies in evolution as well, acknowledging this basic idea uh, that we may feel really separate from the animal kingdom, like we're not of the natural world. But again, probably the similarities between us and animals outweigh the dis dissimilarities, the uh, differences. The Europeans seem to have brought a much different perspective on the natural world when they arrived in the Americas, which would help explain their attitude towards the land and the people who already lived there. The Europeans were entrenched in a Judeo-Christian uh, paradigm, because that was the prevailing religious paradigm that had been in place already uh, for hundreds, well over a thousand years. And also the standards of the agricultural revolution as well, which was based on the idea of domestication. Now, there were facets of the agricultural revolution in the Americas, especially the domestication of uh, crops and the existence of settlements. But um, in uh, Europe and Asia as well, and um, different areas um, in the um, eastern part of the world, there was more that focus on um, domesticating animals. And that included a whole range of different animals that have been domesticated for a long time, such as sheep and goats and horses, um, cows and various other animals used for uh, human uh, labor. And you take these two kind of standards together, there's a depiction of Noah's Ark, and you might get the impression that um, the general perspective that the European cultures brought is that humanity is supposed to rule over the natural world. So not necessarily supposed to exist in harmony with it, but is basically supposed to dominate its um, surroundings. Such systems of belief suggest that humans are built in the image of divinity, but they simultaneously consign the latter to an ethereal realm removed from earthly existence. And that is especially true of the uh, basic logic of Christianity. The idea that um, we are built in the images of God, 
Jesus Christ, for instance, was a person, also the Son of God, apparently, but he was essentially a person walking around on the earth. But so that gives the sense of humans and divinity as being very close together. But on the other hand, the divine, the godly, the spiritual, it's not really here in the natural world. It's kind of consigned to an otherworldly realm. It kind of stands above us in this divine ethereal space. So it really kind of combines that, that idea of we are kind of made in the image of God, and yet God isn't really here among us right now, but kind of exists at a higher state of being above us. These are obviously two, um, if you were to categorize them in this broad way, two very different perspectives on the natural world. And so the Europeans brought quite a different paradigm when they arrived in Americas. And this was a paradigm that would lead into the notion that the natural world is there to be tamed and conquered and exploited. I mean, that was essentially the perspective that they brought. So, European imperialism and the growth of European imperialism as it pertained uh, to uh, the Western Hemisphere, which began in uh, the late uh, 1400s. I say there, expect the unexpected, because if in the year uh, 1400, you had said to somebody who was studying these things at the time, if you had said to them that uh, Europeans are going to um, discover an entire new uh, continent in the space of 100 years, or continents, plural, they're going to discover this, this whole other world, an entire new hemisphere, and they're going to start um, invading that land, and they're going to basically uh, take it over, impose their own cultures, their customs, and their own languages. If you had said that to someone in the year 1400, they probably flat out would not have believed you. For a couple of reasons. First of all, they would not have believed that those continents exist, right? Because they didn't know of their existence at the time. But they also would not have believed that Europeans would be able to do that either. Because you look at what had happened in the previous uh, period of time, Europe had basically come staggering out of the 1300s. I mean, this did not look like a place, a continent that was uh, on the cusp of a uh, world domination. No, this was a period of a considerable hardship, which included the Black Death, which I mentioned before, the bubonic plague, which wiped out at least a third of the people in Europe, and probably even more than that. So a massive um, pandemic, which tore through the continent, had devastating effects on the people and also on the social institutions. And it was also a place of widespread famine as well due to changing weather patterns. Uh, it was probably actually a volcanic eruption, uh, interesting fact, that caused changing weather patterns, which destroyed a lot of crops at the time. So the 1300s were a particularly bad period in Europe. And so as I say, they didn't really look like the kinds of people who were on the cusp of turning everything around. Not only that, but Europe was not known as a place of scientific and technological innovation. Not at this point, really, at least not compared to other uh, places, not compared declared, uh, for instance, to the Muslim world um, in the Middle East. This was partly due to fragmentation, the lack of really unified kingdoms, because you have a bunch of small kingdoms, small nation states in Europe, and also because of the Roman Catholic Church being hostile to such things. The church at this time was still um, the main um, kind of uh, figurehead when it came to disseminating information, and they controlled an enormous amount of the uh, information output that occurred in Europe at the time. And it is always the case, we would have to say, that when you take this kind of uh, monopolistic, authoritative power, then they tend to be hostile to ideas or innovations that go against the grain or are against their accepted standards or their accepted views of things. Someone named uh, Galileo, for instance, would discover that to his detriment many years later. Uh, during the Copernican Revolution, Galileo was one of the people who supported the idea that the Earth revolves around the sun and that the sun is the center of the universe. Catholic Church did not like that idea because it went against their basic interpretation. Galileo actually had to repent, recant that idea and say that he was wrong, even though he knew he was right. right? So these um, kind of religious authorities also stood in the way of uh, innovation and development. And it was only really with the Reformation, which happens later 
in the 1500s. It's only really with the Reformation that that's when you see this kind of idea of scientific, philosophical, and technological innovation take off in Europe. Not because the Protestant churches were a lot more progressive in their views. No, but because you just break apart the single authority. You break apart the single kind of preeminent dominant view. Yeah, question. You mentioned Galileo, but it's actually a bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, just repented by church, was repented by scientists at the time because it was built, it was very much widely believed that there was some people on the church. Yeah, that's a good point. That scientists at the time also would have supported the idea that uh, the Earth is basically the center of the universe. Of course, the church would be the one that would charge it for heresy, for basically going against the um, religious teachings. Yeah, they also didn't really have much evidence. I mean, it was quite good prove it. Mm hmm. Yeah, of course, it was difficult to gather evidence at the time as well. But I mean, the kind of rotation movement of the planets was serving as some of the evidence that they were drawing upon. Um, so this period, when you get into the uh, 1400s, European kingdoms dreamt of gaining access to the famed riches of uh, the Eastern world, which would have included the gold and ivory of sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the silks, gems, and spices of Asia. Now, this was a kind of a narrative that was developing at the time in the minds of the rulers in Europe, as well as explorers and travelers as well. I say there, the problem was that trade routes were increasingly controlled by the fast expanding Ottoman Empire. This gets into that idea that I mentioned before about uh, the Muslim world in the Middle East and the expansion of this empire, the Ottoman Empire, which was becoming a kind of more advanced, uh, more developed imperial state than any that really existed in Europe at the time. There you see a map of their expansion across uh, um, what is now uh, Egypt, parts of the Middle East, uh, Turkey. And there you can see moving forward into the later medieval period and the Renaissance creeping steadily into Europe as well. So the Ottoman Empire, this Muslim empire, was uh, rapidly becoming not just a uh, technologically and scientifically advanced imperial state, but also kind of viable military threat. There are all sorts of trade routes that passed uh, through this region, whether you're heading over into the east, into Asia, where you have all sorts of valuable things like silks, gems, and uh, spices, but also trade routes into Africa as well, where there are a variety of things like gold and ivory. And you note that these different products, these are the valuable things that are kind of serving the role of uh, money at this time. These are the kinds of things that everybody wants. To an extent, of course, they still are. I mean, gold, for instance. Everyone wants to acquire gold. And when you have that good, whether there's a precious metal or anything else that is uh, very popular and very kind of uh, coveted, well, then they be start to play the role of uh, money or currency, something that everyone is eager to uh, lap up. So this is kind of the situation in Europe right now. They're facing this kind of expansion empire and also there's a bunch of stuff that they want in these other places but they kind of have to go through the Ottoman Empire to acquire them. Thus what's the story? Well it's kind of a driving this policy to expand uh, to the west because there you can see Europe at the edges there, and um, if they're blocked to the east, there's this idea, well, they have to start looking in other directions and start looking uh, to the west, and this became the story of where the invasion of the Americas uh, would occur. Kind of the interesting thought here, um, you kind of imagine uh, Europe as a continent facing the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. And perhaps the question that might occur to us immediately is, why didn't they venture outward before that? I mean, we talk about the kind of the remarkable idea of them conducting these voyages at the end of the 1400s. But if the people on the Iberian Peninsula, for instance, in uh, Portugal and Spain, they're looking out at the ocean, right? They see this big stretch of blue sea in front of them. Why wasn't there their impetus to go out and explore and to see exactly what is out there uh, previously? Why did it only start to happen at the end of the um, 1400s? 
But I say there, contrary to popular, popular belief, it was not because they thought uh, the earth was flat. That's one of the kind of myths that existed at the time, that the people in the late 1400s assumed the earth was flat, that if you sailed out too far, you'd drop off the edge of the earth. Um, no, I mean, basically from ancient classical time, from ancient Greece, the accepted interpretation was that the earth is in fact a globe. Um, it was somewhat ironically a uh, somewhat accurate assessment of the Earth's geography, which was itself a deterrent. They hadn't actually explored out here, but they had an idea that it was a very long distance. In fact, they had made estimates, topographical estimates, of how far away, say, uh, China or Japan or India might be from Europe and the western coast of Africa. Now, keep in mind, they're assuming that there's nothing in the middle. There you see a, a map of the Earth from 1492, which is loosely accurate, right? You can get a sense of the um, mainland of Africa, parts of Europe, but of course what's missing is the Americas, right? They don't depict the continents in the middle because they assume that they don't exist. And so they're making these estimates on how far away uh, Japan or China might be. Well, imagine if you have the Atlantic Ocean linked to the Pacific Ocean, and you also have the land mass of the Americas in between. I mean, it's just this enormous stretch of water, right? It's like half the planet just goes on and on and on. So that's why they didn't venture out, because they assume there's nothing there, right? It's just endless, endless sea, and it would take forever to get there, and you'd never make it. So hence the reason there were no journeys. It's kind of like today with um, what we might call interstellar uh, space travel. Of course, we're interested in doing that kind of uh, thing. And we can make the deduction, the assumption that there should be um, life found on other planets. Probably not in the solar system, but once you get outside of the solar system, you should be able to find um, life on other planets. Okay, so why don't we put together these interstellar journeys? Why don't we send out people in spacecrafts to explore the solar system? System because it's a bunch of empty space in between, right? We're never going to get there. We're never going to make it. That was the uh, conclusion that they had reached. And so that's why they didn't send themselves out there into the uh, vast blue reaches. Nonetheless, there were kind of forays outward. I mentioned this idea that it was almost as though Europe was kind of being driven towards a westward expansion. There's this idea that in the east you have the Ottoman Empire. This is becoming this, this big imperial militaristic state. Okay, we can't deal with that. None of the European kingdoms are strong enough at this juncture to actually confront the Ottoman Empire. And so if you're just blocked in that way, well, the alternative is to uh, look the other direction. And so this is essentially what they started doing. The people in particular from the Iberian Peninsula, that's what Spain and Portugal, were making tentative forays into the um, Atlantic, exploring uh, mainly the western coast of Africa, and they were gradually improving uh, their shipbuilding, their navigation techniques, and their uh, geographic knowledge as well. So they're becoming better at seafaring through an incremental process in the 1500s, and this allowed them to not only explore further, but also to uh, conquer, to overrun different places, including perhaps most famously the Canary Islands, islands off the coast, the western coast of uh, Africa. In addition to developing new seafaring strategies, the Spanish and Portuguese also became adept at a rapid conquest. So it wasn't just for the purposes of exploration. It wasn't just for the purposes of discovering places. It was also for the purposes of uh, conducting these kinds of uh, hit and run raids on different areas. Um, and so the use of steel weapons, which I mentioned previously, the use of um, enslavement of local native populations, and also the exploitation of local rivalries, all playing a role. These were all methods of invading places quickly and rapidly, dispensing with um, native populations or enslaving them, turning them into free labor and overrunning various lands, which is what the Spanish and Portuguese did. So it wasn't just for the sake of exploration, but also for the sake of conquest and they were improving their abilities at these things steadily. All of this is to say that the invasion of the Americas was not something that happened out of nowhere. 
It wasn't this sudden thing. There have been kind of tentative movements in that direction previously. The seafaring technology and the invasion techniques were getting better and more ruthless. So they were working themselves up to being able to do something about it. Having said that, nobody was really eager to sort of make this big trek across the ocean, at least um, uh, not yet. There was a resistance to that idea, and just for simple practical concerns, commercial reasons, we might say, nobody really wanted to finance such a venture because, again, the assumption was, well, if you start trekking across the ocean, you're not going to find anything past a certain point. You're just going to sail and sail and sail forever, and there's going to be nothing out there. Crew is going to die, ship is going to sink, and whoever puts up the money to finance this journey will be out the cash that they spent. So it was up to this person who became uh, one of the most famous and infamous uh, people in uh, history, uh, Christopher Columbus, someone who decided that he was actually going to undertake this uh, journey. And his initial goal, his objective, was to reach the Eastern world, not to discover a new continent, again, because nobody knew it existed. His goal was to reach um, China and India. And he thought you could sail across the ocean to get there. And he was also working on the basis of the idea that there are probably other islands out there. They found the Canary Islands. They say, well, shouldn't there be other islands if you just keep going a little bit further? So he was also working on that assumption as well. Columbus's uh, legacy, and of course, here's uh, something that kind of takes us into the heart of the entire legacy of America as a nation, because how many different places are named after uh, Columbus today? You just name them. Columbia, the country. British Columbia in Canada. Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Columbia University. You also have a variety of different statues that were put up, many that have been taken down or torn down, some uh, quite uh, recently. So there's no question that the person's kind of impact has radiated across the entire history, not just of the United States, but the Americas in um, general. And so we should, of course, ask the question of um, who exactly was he? Almost inevitably, unfortunately, here we have a little bit more of this kind of uh, binary uh, dichotomous uh, logic with Christopher Columbus. The kind of uh, patriotic narrative that survived for a long time spoke of him as a kind of a hero, uh, a visionary, someone who was this great explorer, someone who had the uh, courage to set out on this journey, someone who discovered an entire continent, although you can't really discover a place if people already uh, live there. And that was a kind of uh, mainstream conception of Columbus uh, for a long time. A hero of America, if not the Americas, as well as a hero of particular groups of people within um, America, uh, especially Italian Americans, because he himself was Italian. And then the oppositional perspective, which has become uh, more prominent today, uh, points to his legacy in opening the Americas to European exploitation, opening them to genocide, and looking at him himself as a brutal uh, slave trader, slave owner, and someone who imposed these uh, brutal, abominable practices onto the places that he visited. As I say, that's the kind of oppositional perspective of Columbus. Again, finding the facts and finding the information from both of those uh, viewpoints. So who was, who was he really? He was an experienced mariner and traveler who had traveled a lot by this point. He had been as far north as the British Isles and perhaps even Iceland. That's not confirmed, but there is an idea that he came as far north as here and as far south as what is now Senegal, Africa. So he'd been around a lot and he was clearly devoted to the uh, prospects of continuous maritime uh, exploration. Some people have spoken about him as um, a person who was a, a kind of a, a unique um, intellect or a unique mind when it came to geography, when it came to travel. Well, not really. I mean, that, that wasn't the idea. It wasn't that he was had this brilliant insight about uh, the geography of the planet or what might be out there. It was probably more the stories that he had digested and his own personal views that led him to put together this um, journey. In particular, he was inspired by stories of further islands to the west and perhaps even Viking stories 
played a role here if he had heard them because there was um, something of a Norse settlement that survived in Greenland at this juncture, kind of clinging on. But that would have been enough to fuel stories of other lands further to the west that he might have picked up on as well as other narratives of travel, some of them real, some of them fabricated. There are a lot more stories circulating at this time. Stories of Marco Polo, for instance, he was a famous explorer who traveled uh, great distances, but there probably would have been a lot of kind of fabricated, fantastic stories at this time, just the kinds of sensational stories that people like about all the incredible places, islands, different territories you can find if you just look far enough, travel far enough. He probably picked up on those stories and was interested in seeing if they were true. He was a devout, even militant uh, Catholic and something of a religious mystic, and this probably took precedent in his mind over the kind of the scientific information of geography. For instance, he would not have undertaken his voyage um, if it had not been for a uh, scientific miscalculation on his part. He assumed that uh, China and Japan were much closer than they were. That's the reason why he set out on his journey. So he wasn't right when he was basically mapping the topography of the Earth. If he had actually tried to sail from uh, Spain all the way across the Atlantic and Pacific, right, never would have made it. Never would have made it. They would have died before they got there. So if he had actually been right in what he was looking for, he would have been wrong. But it was because there was a continent there that actually salvaged the journey. Milton Catholic also looking for conversion. That was one of the reasons he gave as to why he wanted to visit the Eastern world, why he wanted to visit India and China, because you have a whole bunch of non-Christians there who are just waiting to be saved, who are just waiting to be brought to the purpose of salvation. His motives, what was he actually trying to do? Well, of course, we have to piece this together retroactively. Exploration, I mean, that seems to be his thing. He was a sailor, maritime explorer. He liked to travel, he liked to go to different places. Affluence, right? He wanted to be rich. Seems fairly clear that this was a commercial enterprise. It was not exploration for the sake of doing it. I mean, no one would ever finance a journey at that time. No, the point is to make the journey pay off. And you make it pay off by finding access to new trade routes and by finding all sorts of things that can be sold. And when I say things that can be sold, I mean a lot of the stuff I mentioned previously, whether it's gold, ivory, silk, spices, or alternative alternatively people, because there was a rousing slave trade at this time as well. Fame as well. He probably wanted to be famous, probably wanted to be someone who was known as a discoverer, an individual finds a new uh, lands, new places, and conversion too. He seemed to be motivated by the idea of converting a new people to the Christian church. And all of these um, motives, intentions, worked together, played off of each other. It's exploration, affluence, fame, and conversion. Not necessarily in that order. I should mention the printing press here because this is actually something that was um, uh, quite important and became significant both before and um, after Columbus's voyage. Um, I mentioned that Europe wasn't exactly a place known for technological or scientific innovation. Well, the introduction of the printing press turned out to be quite um, an important innovation, came to other parts of the world as well. But here was something introduced in uh, the 1400s that allowed for the circulation of more information about exploration. The printing press in general allowed for the circulation of a lot more texts, writings, documents, books. Prior to the printing press, you had a uh, very few texts, documents, and books in circulation. Um, the reason being that in order to make a copy of one of those things, you needed someone to sit there and write it down. I mean, that, that's how you get a book at that time. You just have someone who sits down, transcribes it, writes it out. Very few people even know how to write. Very few people would even pick up a book prior to the printing press because there just aren't enough of them, and thus the overwhelming majority of people are illiterate. But with the printing press, there's a much more efficient and effective means of putting text together, putting documents together, putting books together, and thus you have a lot more information circulating. You have all of these um, travel narratives, travel logs, again, some real, some fabricated, that spreads around and so people get excited about the idea of journeying and traveling. But this was also very crucial um, subsequently as well. Why did uh, the Vikings fail to establish a kind of a permanent foothold in uh, the Americas? 
in Labrador and Canada? Well, partly because their numbers were very small. They just had a uh, small uh, a settlement, uh, partly because they were living in what is, after all, some uh, kind of uh, dire, frigid territory, Labrador and Newfoundland. But really the big reason, not enough people heard about it. That was a kind of huge factor. Word did not spread enough that there was all this land. If you just go across the ocean fast enough, didn't have the circulation of information at that time. The stories of the Viking travels would have been consigned to a smaller place. Not so with Columbus. After he makes his voyage, everyone starts hearing about it because you have the printing press. So you have all this information. Hey, you know, he sailed out there, reached it in this number of days, and he found this land and these people. And so everyone starts becoming interested in this idea of exploration. After some trouble, Columbus secured patronage for his proposed journey from the Spanish monarchy. Had to come from a monarchy. There was no kind of wealthy person who was willing to put up the money for this journey. For the reasons I mentioned previously, they thought they were going to lose all of their money if they did that because he wasn't going to find anything. So he had to uh, appeal to royal households that would want to do these things, not just for affluence, but also for the kind of glory of their own nation. Uh, he tried, I know with Portugal, I think he tried with England as well. Um, they weren't eager to do that. And it ended up being the Spanish monarchy who said, yes, we will finance this journey that you want to take. The purpose of the journey was to find an alternative passage to the Eastern world, particularly India. I mentioned that previously. He wasn't looking for a new continent. He was looking for new islands if they were there, but the main purpose of it was to get all the way to the Eastern world. And uh, this was not exactly a massive convoy. This was approximately 90 men. They were all men, no women, who set out in uh, three ships. He had rel relatively good sailing, um, some snafus along the way, but in just over a month, the ships traversed the Atlantic Ocean, landing in what is now the Bahamas. And so, strange story, it was kind of as simple as that. In the space of just over a month, suddenly they were there. Landed, as I said, they don't know exactly what island in the Bahamas, but that's basically where they ended up. And here they had their first encounter with the native inhabitants, the Taino on this island in the Bahamas. Columbus actually kept a record of his journey. He records the sailing passage, commenting on the different things, such as the dolphins that he sees, and also the morale of the crew, and also describes his first encounter with these people. And what Columbus describes in his journal is a series of uh, cordial exchanges among them. Basically, the native inhabitants welcoming the new people uh, here, uh, being um, eager to uh, learn about their passage, their journey, kind of trying to exchange words and information uh, with each other. Although we kind of have to maybe take that a little bit uh, with a grain of salt because um, Columbus was recording these things with a particular purpose, a kind of agenda in mind, wanted to present a particular portrait of these people. Why? Well, because he was interested in the idea of conversion, converting them to Christianity. He was also interested in the idea of fur further voyages, and it was going to be a lot easier to sell the idea of further voyages if he presented the inhabitants as being very friendly and docile people. It wasn't going to fly very well with the monarch if he said there's a bunch of hostile people there, because then there's going to be this idea, oh, we better not go back. What was the actual exchanges, the interactions among these people like? Well, let's start from the fact that they would not have spoken a word of each other's language. So, I mean, level of communication among them. Start just with that. I mean, the level of exchange could only be uh, rudimentary. But another thing that has to stand out about this would that this would be a violent collision between two different worlds. I mean, this is the the idea of entire branches of humanity separated from each other for thousands of years and suddenly coming together again. It's a collision between uh, different paradigms, different belief systems, different uh, backgrounds. And what is the tendency in that situation? Well, for Columbus and the um, Spanish explorers, their first priority was to impose their worldview onto the new land. Not necessarily an inexplicable thing to do, the kind of idea of trying to make this as familiar as possible, trying to organize it and structure it into what you're used to. Thus, he comes to the conclusion that he has found um, part of India. 
because that's familiar to him. He knows what India is. He doesn't know what the Americas are. So he says, oh, okay, this must be part of India. And thus he designates the native inhabitants Indians, a term that stuck unbelievably almost up until the present day, since it was nothing more than a simple mistake that the first person made. So that's one of the kind of unbelievable points of history, naming them Indians, and also trying to bring the people within the Judeo-Christian framework, seeing them immediately as um, uh, poor, ignorant heathens, people who have not been exposed to Christianity and the Word of God, and also subsequently bringing them into the logic of modern capitalism and exploitation as well, because its first priority, of course, was to see how this land and these people could be exploited or paid off in some way. Because again, that's the purpose of the journey, underlying purpose of it, not just to discover things, but to also find riches in whatever form they might be. People can be valuable as servants, as slaves, sold for the purposes of commercial exploitation. If they have certain goods, such as gold or ivory, well, that's good too. That's also something that you can make use of. So I would say that this would be the kind of first perspective of the original uh, arriving explorers, the idea of imposing immediately their perspective, their worldview, not looking at this land as the gateway to a new world or an alternative culture, but trying to figure out as quickly as possible how it could be subsumed to their own culture, to their own perspective. So we're out of time. So yeah, well... Um, yeah, get through the rest of this. Next time, finish up with this uh, lecture and move on to the uh, second one on the colonies as well. So enjoy the rest of the week.